Venom is That's like not, a flesh-eating virus that they have or something. Not good. Eating. My sister-in-law was out running and actually got bit by a small rattlesnake. And it's not good to get bit by a small rattlesnake. Well, at least there's anti-venom the, for those. You know. We have the there is, uh, pygmy don't, rattlers. Don't ever get bit. It is incredibly expensive. Uh, she has fabulous insurance, thank goodness. But the cost for treating a, a rattlesnake bite is astronomical. Yeah, you ever got treatment for psoriasis? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eczema. Well, yeah, go on any any drug you see advertised on television, the nightly news. Google the the monthly cost of that drug without insurance, and you'll find that almost every one of them is forty to sixty thousand dollars a year for any one of those drugs, and you have to take them for a lifetime because uh, yeah, they don't cure the disease; they just make the symptoms go away. Oh, man. Courtney, I take two Pixent shots, two thousand dollars a pop. Oh, that's nothing, you know. The uh, uh, Sky Rizzy, those are thirteen thousand dollars a shot. So did anybody else watch the YouTube uh, red carpet of uh, Quantum Mania? Quantum Mania. Oh, tell us about it. Oh, you've got. Oh, no, it was just a. New, it was just uh, a standard. Marvel. It was just a standard red carpet, uh, but it was it, it was just interesting that they had that on on YouTube as a live feed, and they had a couple a uh, couple stations, and of course they interviewed all the people, and is and that then uh, everybody piled in? Nobody got to see the movie. Disney or Marvel. Yeah, Marvel. Yeah, so it's Disney. So it was probably on the Disney Channel, and they were somebody else was just carrying, carrying it. Somewhere. Oh no, no, this was all on YouTube. Nothing was on the Disney. I know, Channel. but they put it on YouTube too. Yeah. No, I checked the Disney Channel. They didn't have red carpet mm. there; just YouTube. Was it at the El Capitan Theater? Where was the premiere? You know, I don't know. Um, it looked Probably pretty enclosed, so I'm not sure. Was it yesterday? No, it wasn't at the El Capitan because they would have closed off Hollywood Boulevard, and I drove in front of it yesterday. Oh, it looks like they did uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch for that. But I only saw it on YouTube. And it was in Los Angeles. I just don't know where. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital and general production. The second hour is usually something you want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to answer your questions about alpha channels. 
Alpha channels are kind of part of everything <laughs> that we do in computer graphics and much of what we do with video, people don't quite understand them most of the time. So we'll answer your question, show you a couple examples and uh, hopefully demystify it. So uh, stay tuned for that. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? Good morning, Alex. First in from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. What do you think of video editing via text in Adobe Premiere? There's a long link to it there if you want to try it out. Go ahead, Mitchell. It, uh, it's interesting. I saw it yesterday in a press release from Adobe. I, I, it, I think it depends on the kind of an editor you are. I mean, if you're a classic AB role type editor, you're a visual thinker and you're dealing with graphics, I can see where it would be fast uh, to work from a script and uh, be able to put uh, uh, the markup text in there that changes uh, the uh, transitions. But uh, I'm I'm not I'm going to be a hard sell on this. I think it's uh, <laughs> it's very interesting, but I'm not quite there yet. Good, Bill. And so I've been I, I agree with Mitch 100. percent It depends on your style as an editor. I, I've been friends for many years with Phil Hodges and Dr. Greg Clark, who did Lumberjack Systems. Still, they have a, a product that does exactly this, and they've been fiddling around with it and developing it for a decade at least. For people who have tons of text-based work, and that's the way you think, it is great, particularly for creating rough cuts uh, out of a lot of material. So I think it'll be a boon to people who use uh, Premiere and like this style. I don't think it's going to replace standard editing things, and it's certainly not going to move me back over in that direction after so many years of database-driven editing, which is what kind of I see Final Cut as. But I think it's great, and, and hopefully for the people who need it, they'll use it and enjoy it. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So I've used it, I've actually used it a little bit longer than the beta, the beta that's been out. Um, and it's pretty interesting. The, the biggest problem when you do that is all of a sudden you're starting to jump cut everything and you're taking out the ums and the ahs and you're taking out uh, certain words and then all of a sudden everything just feels a little very skippy. And, uh, and of course, sometimes jump cuts don't, don't natively work. They'll, there's always like a little tick or something like that that you have to extra edit out. Um, and then of course you have that uh, morph, cut uh, effect that's in Premiere Pro that can kind of mask it a little bit, but you're, you're doing a lot of extra editing to get just single words out. So if you've got somebody that's really long, elongating, you know, like pauses or ums and ahs, and you need to take all that out, it works, uh, works fairly well. But once again, you're just going to have to go back with a fine tooth comb and make sure that every, every jump is, is, is working. Hey, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I haven't used this, but it sounds interesting. The um, one thing, I, if you're doing a documentary, I don't know how it handles, you know, cutaways and B-roll and that kind of stuff, the silent stuff that uh, do you type into the text, you know, cut away to close up of the ashtray, you know, et cetera, or reaction shot goes here. And does it follow those? Doesn't follow those? Yeah, then I've seen I've seen some films cut by real editors that are uh, bad because it starts to cut on the dialogue, on the dialogue, on the dialogue, on the dialogue. And there's no reaction shots, there's no cutaways, there's no pauses, you know, um, yeah. for people to think before they speak. Uh, and so uh, it tends to be a very mechanical uh, edit. Uh, hopefully that's not what it ends up with. Yeah, we've used something, I mean, so there's a lot of things that are doing this. Premiere's doing this, but there's also Descript and other things that are, you know, making these things easier. Um, a lot, we don't usually use them for the final edit. Now, we've been doing something like this for probably almost a decade and a half, um, you know, so uh, for on my end. And basically, it's not been uh, as automated as it is now. Um, so what, what the traditional path was, okay, I've got a bunch of interviews, and I will, um, I send those out and have them transcribed. And then this is back when we had to send them out to have them transcribed. <laughs> we sent them out to have them transcribed and the client would make what we would call uh, or the director would make what we'd call a paper edit. They would just highlight all the things they want they want to see there and we would build an assembly. And so we weren't actually doing the edit that you finally that you see, but it allowed us to just assemble all the text that they just look at the text like, oh, I want this, I want this. And it's much easier than watching everything is to think about what everybody's saying. And so then they just build the assembly and we would just take, now we used to go back and look at the time code and go figure this all out. Now what you can do with Descript and with um, Simon Says and with now Premiere, and I'm sure that we'll be able to do this with Final Cut eventually, is you go through and just select all the text that you want. Then you get in a, a quick assembly very, very fast. 
that's not going to be that what anybody sees. It just gets all the video clips that you want next to each other. And then, well, sometimes it'll be what you see. <laughs> Some YouTubers will probably just put it out there like that. But but typically after that, what we would do is go back and we massage the edits between the things. We would add, um, we'd paper over them with B-roll. We would, you know, add all the things that we want to add. We'd add reaction shots. We'd add all the other things to it. But man, does it speed things up. So when you have the, when you are able to just select all the text and then just say, give me all of those, those clips end to end, it really makes things a lot faster than, than what you had before. Uh, next question. Next question in from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, guys. Is there a way to force content from an iPad, pictures, video, etc., to be auto resized to 16 to 9 aspect ratio when connected to an ATAM? Thanks. Go, go, Jason. Well, you could do it with a decimator, but it might not always make the right decision. Um, there's no great solution other than maybe running it through an Apple TV um, to make it always work. I don't know. Yeah, if you want content to come out that way, um, one thing to look at is Keynote. So Keynote will display, so it'll send out of the HDMI to your ATEM always at 16 by 9 because it's assuming, or if you're in, in presentation mode, it'll always be in 16 by 9. So you could put all the content into there if you're going one after the other, and it will display it correctly. Um, so, And I don't know what apps, all apps do that, but I do, do know that Keynote will always display 16 by 9 if you have a 16 by 9 deck. It's going to send out HDMI at 16 by 9. Next question. Tobias Moss from Minneapolis asking, please discuss the cost value and use case difference of filming a band using a venue's built-in multicam system versus hiring dedicated cinematographers and camera people. Go ahead, Jesse. I don't know which venue you're talking about, but I have yet to visit a venue that would have a built-in system that I would uh, even consider touching. I would definitely go with uh, your own team that can design around the needs of that band. Go ahead, Jeffrey. It's been a few years since I've uh, worked at a venue, uh, but we did have a couple that did have in-cam systems. And what we did was we took our in-cam systems and actually hooked them up into the security systems so we could see what was going on in different angles, which was, which was great. Uh, now, the real question is what happens with the video? that comes from that some of the venues actually keep those videos and so a good contract is uh, is very important in uh, in putting that together so they to make sure that those videos don't get leaked out especially if it's copyrighted music if it's bands that uh, that uh, make their living off of uh, off of this type of stuff and then uh, the other thing is that you just got to watch out for the venue space because sometimes some of these places they don't want you to touch their gear or their spaces so you'll probably have to move the cameras in a, in a different spot, which could also cause uh, issues for uh, attendees uh, coming in and going from there. Go ahead, Bill. It's never going to be as good. Any fixed system is never going to be as good as, as creative brains behind cameras and the ability to move in space and execute shots as really needed. However, I think if you've got a band that's doing a 10-day run in a place and you're just not sure whether there might be magic some night, having something like this in place that you could get three or four camera shots out of the band's performance, and maybe you'll get that night that it's just magic and the energy is perfect and the playing is fabulous, and you don't want to lose that. So I can see a reason for it. I don't think it's ever going to replace a real crew, though. Yeah, the problem is that you have all that magic and then you will have shot it in horrible positions <laughs> with, with with cheap cameras. And then you'll be like, oh, I really wish we had had real cameras there. I mean, typically um, you want to see a band, if a band's playing over and over again, but even then, I mean, the the the, the venues are okay. I mean, the, the, the video cameras are okay typically. Now there are some venues, um, we have uh, Accidental Theater and others that have invested a lot more in the cameras. So the built-in system is not created equal. You could definitely have a venue with great cameras. So there's a venue called Austin City Limits that has great cameras. <laughs> you know, so so they uh, so it, it may have, the built-in version may be very, very well developed. Um, but typically the kind of things that make a difference are larger sensor size. And that's usually what most people don't invest in. Um, so like if you're in a small venue, you, you really want Super 35 or bigger, and most of the venues are going to have cheap little PTZs that are not going to do that. Um, and so, so it's not going to look, you know, cinematic. And I don't mean by frame rate, I just mean short depth of field and, and nice bokeh and things that really um, definitely impact average view time. You know, so if you're looking at how, how, how long someone's going to watch something, um, it is, it's important to, uh, to think about that process. So anyway, so, so you just want to, um, I don't think that 
I don't think it's worth the energy typically. If you just want to capture something and see how they did. But if you're not going to put real cameras into a bar to capture a band, it's probably not. No one's, it's kind of like everybody using their cell phone at a, at a concert. No one's going to watch that again. <laughs> so like, you know, it's so very rarely are people going to watch uh, a cheaply shot band uh, very often. Um, it's it's a good record that they were there, maybe for good behind the scenes for the documentary when they get big. But but outside of that, it's it's kind of worthless, worthless content and not really worth the effort. Next question. From Zach Phillips in Philadelphia, PA. I know that Zoom ISO is what's behind the scenes making office hours work, but do individual panelists also join through Zoom ISO for their own monitoring needs, or does that even work? It does. Um, I'm doing pieces of it right now, and I'll be doing more of it as we go through. So I'm I'm not joining every day, but I'm joining more and more, and I will eventually join every day with Zoom ISO. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is exactly what you're talking about, is being able to send different monitors, different people, different things that are coming out of here into different monitors outside, as well as being able to test cutting between everybody and, and doing that edit. So, um, you know, I expect to be uh, fully in Zoom ISO uh, within the next two weeks. I'm traveling next week, so I think. <laughs> so so uh, if I do that, then it'll, it'll be delayed by a week. But outside of that, um, I'm, you know, I've moved big chunks of my system over to SDI and now I'm, and I'm, I just got a new camera to test. So hopefully we'll have it done um, in the next day or two. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Next question. Paul Buchan from Columbus, Ohio, asking, AMC theaters are going to start charging based on where you sit in the theater. Curious to hear the panel's thoughts. Go ahead, Courtney. You know, um, the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, which is owned by Disney, tried that when they first opened the theater. They had, uh, you know, the center section of the theater was priced a lot higher than the side sections. And this is only going to work on films that are sold out, you know, performances that are sold out or very close to capacity. Because what, would, what happened is people would buy the cheap seats on the side beforehand, and as soon as the movie started, shoom, they'd all move to all the empty, the entire center of the theater was just empty because no one would go for the double price of the center seats. So they'd buy the cheap seats. So then they had to imply the Gestapo uh, uh, <laughs> ushers that would go in after the movie starts and, and see the people that moved into the seats and make a move back. And it was very disruptive. And it, they only lasted about a year. I, I don't think they're still doing it. So I think the same thing is going to happen with AMC. I read this article, and I did note that it's only on performances after 4 o'clock. So matinees will not be affected with this uh, inflated price for where you sit uh, policy. I don't think it's going to last very long. AMC is almost in bankruptcy anyway. So maybe they're just trying to boost their bottom line. But I think it's going to hurt them more than it helps them. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, they just closed a theater uh, that they bought out, uh, which was the Sun, one of the Sundance theaters that uh, Robert Redford uh, built up here in Madison. And uh, it's 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 an interesting idea. I think what they're going to do is they'll probably end up putting it in their rewards uh, club program. So if you get so many points, then you'll have premier seating, so you won't have to pay that extra extra fee. But as Courtney said, you know, if if the seat is empty, somebody's going to go for it. Uh, and uh, there's probably going to be a lot of complaints off of it too. So, Yeah, I mean, I think that they already are doing that. So if you're in their A-list or the A-list um, group, you don't have to pay the it's, – it's really more of – I think it's more of a play to get people into A-list and not as much of a play to get people to actually pay for them. It's just to create an added value like, uh, uh, like an airline ticket. Uh, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, this uh, sounds like bad PR that's completely unenforceable by, you know, the, the average minimum wage employee. I, yeah, <laughs> this is a non-starter. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, as someone who only will sit in about 10 seats uh, in, in a theater. Like, so there's the middle 10 seat. There's 10 seats in most theaters that I'll be willing to sit in. And in fact, I don't, I mean, I go to AMC, but I, I only go to Dolby Cinema or IMAX and I won't sit in any and I will not, I'll just keep going out days until I get to the seats that I want um, because I'm not going to, you know, if I bring my family, it's $150 for me to, you know, show up. <laughs> just so I'm not going to, I will sit in exactly the seats that I want. And if they made them 25 or 50% more, I would, it would make, just make my job easier. <laughs> so, so, so I would, because I'm not, you know, there's so much cost related to just going um, that, that I, you know, I, I think that, and I don't go very often, so I can spend money on it because it's, because I'm not going to go very often. <laughs> so, so anyway, I think that there's probably a growing number of people that would pay for that. We'll see how, we'll see what happens. I think when they first started with seating that was, um, numbered seating, like where you could buy a ticket for a, for a, for a given seat, 
I think there was a lot of people kind of gaming that system and trying to figure it out. But I think that now we're kind of used to the fact that we're in the seats that, you know, like I got there right before watching Avatar and some guy was in my seats and, you know, cause I was in the middle and, and, uh, you know, I was like, Hey buddy, move over. Like, this is my seat. You know, like I, I, I was, I was nice about it. But, but the bottom line is, is that, um, uh, I think that the style has changed a little bit about, you know, about what you think you can and can't do. And I think that there are people like me, like I, if you look at the, I look at the, the seat, seating arrangements all the time. And what you see is that little clump constantly being bought. You know, because more and more people understand that the quality of your experience drops dramatically as you move away. Like they, they love to tell you that every seat's special, but there's really only 10 or 15 seats in a theater that are worth watching the, the, the film. <laughs> you know, so, so after that, you might as well. I mean, like they should give away the seats down below, you know, down below the rough, the two, the two rows right in front of the screen. Those should be like a dollar each. They should be like the, you know, because... Because they're just no one that they should be against the law. So anyway, um, uh, so so that's I, I think that that doing it like we do with stadiums and everything else, I think makes sense. But it it, it only made sense, I think, now that there'll be there, there's going to be less and less theaters, you know. And so I think part of what they're doing is, you know, when there's less and less theaters, there'll be there'll be higher there'll be more and more demand to make more money on on the seats. And but I will tell you that as someone who's um, worked with the folks that build the theaters, <laughs> you know, that, that there's like 10 or 15 seats that are worth watching the film in. And after that, it, it drops off. It starts to, if you're going to spend that kind of money, it, it drops off pretty dramatically. Next question. Tobias Moss from Minneapolis, Minnesota. My synagogue is losing our homegrown head of production, TriCaster, Livestreamer, A2, hybrid setups throughout the campus, etc. It's been a 20-hour-a-week job with weekends and unpredictable hours due to funerals, etc. How do we find a replacement? Jason. So I, I've got to answer your question with a question. Um, does the synagogue not see value in in finding budget for this? Um, because if so, there's undoubtedly someone who will it's, fit the bill. It's really hard to find someone who can do all the things. Like and 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 the cost of a person that really can do all the things is usually it's not just budget. It's it's a lot of budget to get someone who is multi multi-skilled against all of the things that are necessary and really understands the thing. So I, I get the, I mean, we've tried to put, you know, there's not that many, there's a bunch of us here that do that, but there's not that many people in the world that do that. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I've had this problem with uh, teleprompter operators. The problem is if you don't offer them, you know, with a 20 hour a week job, if you don't offer them enough job, even if you're paying, I don't know, and we don't know if this is a paid position, you didn't say, but, um, or if it's a volunteer position, um, but with 20 hours a week, you know, you can't find anybody who will commit to doing it without do, having to do other jobs. And the other jobs will interfere with that $20 a week, that 20 hour a week uh, job. And especially if that 20 hour a week job is not predictable uh, because of funerals or services changing or work schedules changing. Um, so if you hire a rabbinical student or something, even if, uh, you know, they want to learn on the job, <clears throat> they're, you know, that may not, may interfere with their class schedule. So unpredictability uh, is going to be, is the major problem in finding. I would say look for somebody who's experienced but just newly retired. And if you can find somebody that's newly retired and experienced, they don't have anything on their schedule. They may want to donate their time. They may have, uh, you know, they may want a charitable deduction that they can put on on their tax forms. So look there if you can find somebody that's knowledgeable enough in the area and newly retired. Yeah, the, the, um, there's, not a, there's not a quick fix, you know, to this generally. Um, the, the main thing is, is that in the house of worships that I've worked with in the past and even the ones that I grew up in, the big, the big draw was you, you built a team and you constantly were working on that team and you were constantly rotating the team around. So if you had somebody that really knew a lot, what you wanted to do is get them into a management role as fast as you could so that they could help ma you pay them to manage a volunteer team that is um, rotating and working through it so that you never had one person that knew how to do everything. Um, you had one person that did, did understand all those things, but they were basically in an EIC position, not in a uh, not in an operational position, or they'd st sit in wherever you didn't have a volunteer that day. The key with making that work is that you actually have to It'll sound backwards, but you have to be actually pretty particular and really push to create great quality. I think a lot of people have volunteer people come in for whatever organization they have and they feel like, oh, I can't push down. I can't be particular and I can't make it. But what you want to do is create a training program that people are excited 
about going to because they're doing great. People want to do great work. And if you don't tell them how to do that or you don't push them to do it in a nice way, um, then they don't, if you push too hard, then they don't come back. But if you push hard enough where they realize they're doing something that matters, that they, that the, that the quality matters, you end up with a large number of people that want to play, you know, and at that point, um, you now have a lot of resiliency, you know, over those things. But anytime, you know, in a, like a house of worship or a volunteer organization that you see a single person, um, that can do it, you, you, you know, you need to, figure that out because, because you're, you'll end up with the problems that you're having right now. <laughs> and so, so, um, you know, co constantly training and constantly building teams around that is, is a, uh, is, is, it's a long term, it's a farming problem, not a hunting and gathering problem, as I've said in the past. <laughs> so, um, and you really want to think about how do you, and, and, and that gives them skills that theoretically they could use outside of what you're doing as well, you know, so how do you make that more transferable? Um, and, and what's interesting is that, and you have some great equipment I can see by by the list that you have but that's what I, I I think I've said this before I was at a house of worship and I they had this huge Yamaha CL5 for house of worship and I was like wow that's a lot of mixer for what you're doing and they said yeah but it's a lot easier to get volunteers <laughs> so, so they you know people see the big mixer they want to learn how to use it and so and so that's the um so it was an inter I, it, 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 that's when it snapped for me that that uh, investing in equipment and and the guidance and everything else makes a huge difference next question from Zach Phillips in Philadelphia, what is the favorite application for DMX control via companion on a Mac OS, Windows, and Linux? I don't know if we have the answer for that. I mean, I think that, um, and, and I don't know how often you're tying the DMX back. I mean, I think that, um, I believe that, uh, that Tlaloc uh, uses uh, the, the ETC um, board, and I don't, but I don't know how much he uses it with, uh, specifically with companion to control those things. So that would be the, I mean, there's a, the question is, 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 do you want the board or do you want the board with the, the companion? And I think that that's the, that's the question. But I, I think that companion would probably work pretty well with an ETC board. And I think that's what, again, the, a lot of folks that I know are using um, to, to make that happen. Next question. Paul Buchan from Columbus, uh, Ohio, asking, has anyone had an HDMI DA limit the color range from full to 16 to 235 on a monitor? Would that most likely be caused by the DA or perhaps one of the monitors plugged into it is limiting all the outputs? It's, it's a pure DA. It'd be very unusual for a pure DA and probably not a great thing for a pure pure DA to, um, to do, do what you're talking about. Uh, so, so I think that you would want to get a different one if, if it's doing that. DA should not color or change. It's not, it's designed specifically. Most DAs are designed specifically, unless it's like a decimator that might be doing some kind of color shift. But, but most of them are designed specifically not to do anything different to the signal, just, just to uh, reamplify it and send it to multiple outputs. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, maybe it's not the DA, maybe it's the monitor. Sometimes the monitors will, uh, uh, limit the uh, range of the color space in order to reserve certain colors for their uh, on-screen menus and things so, so that they'll always appear on top and they won't uh, knock out the rest. But uh, that's older technology. I don't know if they're still doing that, but check your monitor. It may be your monitor. Try it on different monitors and see if it's the same. Next question. From Alexander Knight in Vancouver, BC, Canada, a client of mine has asked for subtitles on the TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube short videos I'm creating. What tools do I need to automatically generate these? Go ahead, John. The tool that the kids are using these days is called CapCut. It does speech to text and then throws that text up onto the timeline, and then you can format the text. They have the different fonts and the colors, and that's the one I, I'm seeing being used a lot. Go, Jeffrey. So Adobe and DaVinci and uh, Final Cut all have caption options. I use, uh, I use uh, Premiere Pro for my videos, and I've been doing a lot of shorts where I've been putting in the captions. Uh, so basically you transcribe it, you edit your transcription, and then you throw it in captions. And then you, uh, the, the biggest part on doing the captions is creating them to kind of look fun. In, uh, in your shorts and your TikToks, I keep it as simple as possible. So a font that I like in a uh, area that that you know, with a background so they can see the text if it's uh, depending on what the uh, video is about. And of course, moving it around so it doesn't get in the way with other stuff is, is always a plus there. But uh, Premiere Pro does a, a decent job with that. Good, Bill. 
Yeah, your workflow is going to be important because you want to make this as easy and as kind of automated as possible. And as Jeffrey just mentioned, most of the major nonlinear editing systems have captioning built in now. Often it's a real simple process of exporting the audio track from your desktop. The computers, the AI computers, I use Simon Says, but there's other ones out there. I think Whipster on the uh, Premiere side will gather that, turn it into text, and send it back to you with proper captioning. Now, captioning can be closed captions or open captions. A lot of the people on these social media sites want open text captioning as opposed to traditional broadcast closed captioning. Just understand that difference. But if you can find something that has a workflow extension or something that builds it inside your program so you don't have to leave and go do this as a separate step, you'll be ahead of the game. And uh, Jesse? Also, double check with your client whether they want burnt in subtitles or if they want like a sidecar uh, subtitle file that they upload in parallel with the video file. And make sure you do that check uh, for each platform as well. Next question. Tobias Moss in Minneapolis, Minnesota, asked with auto captions of synagogue services on Zoom, we get good accuracy for English moments, but absurd attempts during Hebrew. Is there an auto captioning service for Zoom that simply goes silent during Hebrew and kicks back in for English? Uh, go ahead, Courtney. I don't know of one like that, but maybe you ought to try running the Hebrew, running all of it through Google Translate. Uh, because apparently Google Translate is pretty good at uh, fairly accurate at translating Hebrew to English. So uh, if you run it through Google Translate first and then have your auto captioner take the translation and put it in. Next question. John Preto from Las Vegas, Nevada, and the AI race intensifies. Microsoft has an AI announcement today, Google tomorrow, and Apple's having an in-person event. Consumers are the winners. What are your thoughts? Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I expect to see um, Microsoft talk. They've already announced the integration of Teams, AI into Teams. The the uh, the summarization tools and the AI is fantastic, like Alex mentioned yesterday. Um, Google's going to announce Bard, Bard B A R D tomorrow, which is a which is a subset of Lambda, which has been around for a long time. And then Apple yesterday announced an in uh, person event, uh, an AI coming up. So here we go. Yeah. It Obviously, these things have been around for a little while. <laughs> like they didn't just come up. They didn't just develop them in panic of of this. It's just that I think that a lot of it had to do with perceived liability, um, you know, uh, related to releasing them because we can see the mistakes that are already happening. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I think uh, Google is going to uh, – Google's kind of getting nervous because Microsoft is putting uh, ChatGPT into, uh, into Bing search. And so they're nervous about losing some of their search – domination of 90% of all searches. So I think uh, they will be moving the BARD quickly from a separate app into part of, uh, or, an, or a thing you can turn on in all your uh, Google search boxes. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, happens there and, and what, I don't know what Apple's going to announce. Maybe it's new hardware, maybe it's new software. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead, uh, John. I wanted to I wanted to add two cents in there about search engines. So so the transformers as they work today need to be predefined. So the models are predefined, and so they're not specifically good for any current things in a search engine. So I'm calling the integration of AIs hybrids. So you've got search, you've got index search, which is giving you all the current information, and then the AI will help you find and answer stuff better than you did before. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how those are integrated in. Absolutely. Uh, next question. From Zach Phillips in Philadelphia, PA. For panel participation, do I really need a fancy Studio Technologies Dante talkback like uh, Alex and Mitch? Or can I use the mute and talk buttons on my Apollo? Or is it just fine to use Zoom OSC and Companion for Zoom and Unity mute toggle? Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, Zach, the, the issue primarily is how do you get to it fast if you need it, particularly if you're a reader. Uh, if you're a reader, you just need to have the ability to hit the zoom button, or excuse me, the mute button um, on a dedicated button that's within reach of your fingers. I always keep my fingers on the mute button. I don't think I could do that on a device, including my ATEM, where I have so many other buttons that are on there to deal with. And the only other problem with uh, utilizing something that goes via companion into, say, a stream deck is that it's not 100% accurate. In other words, sometimes you get a double mute when you click it. Um, it's just not uh, at the kind of level that we want. So we recommend hardware mute as far as the uh, reading and uh, general use on it as a panelist. Go ahead, Bill. 
Studio Technologies boxes are great if you don't want to go to that. I just use this. It's a Rolls mic mute. It's the MS-111, and it costs, I think, about 50 bucks, and works great. There you go, Jason. I have a whole host of ways to do hardware mutes, and since day one in office hours, um, I've used Zoom and mapped globally to F19, and it has never failed. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I've tried uh, some of the soft software-based uh, or keyboard-based mutes and have been problematic because a lot of times it depends on focus. If you don't have a Mac where you you have a an F19 or you know a key on your keyboard that doesn't exist on most keyboards that you can't accidentally hit, or that is global, is truly global and is not used by something else that doesn't depend on focus, so you have to be in Zoom for it to work. Um, I have hardware uh, as soon as my Rodecaster Pro comes back uh, today. I do have hardware mute on there, but one problem is I've been always using the, uh, as a panelist, always using the zoom mute just by clicking on the, the icon on the screen because that always works and it makes sure that I have zoom as, uh, uh, has the focus when I, because I click on it. So the uh, companion apps that use a keyboard control you know, they can fail and they can uh, sometimes work, sometimes don't. Uh, and the problem with the hardware mutes, like uh, the ones that uh, Bill is using and Alex uses and Mitch uses, is you can't tell when they're muted or not by looking at their icons in Zoom and the people in the back end controlling it don't know if somebody's mic is unmuted because they're always unmuted in Zoom. So it, it makes for it, and they might accidentally mute them because they think that they're unmuted when they're really muted by your hardware. So they have to know all that on the back end. So it kind of makes it problematic uh, for the people that are trying to control the audio on the back end. Yeah, the, um, I would say that it, it's very hard to be a reader or a host. What we found is almost impossible to be an effective reader or host without some kind of hardware mute. Um, being a panelist, I don't think you need it. I think you can turn it on and off. I think you can, you, there's a lot of software ways to do that. You can use uh, your stream deck. You can do a lot of things. As a heart, as a host or a reader, we're turning it off, on and off so often that um, we found that anybody that's a host or reader that doesn't have a hardware mute often is either slow to the gun, you know, as far as getting it in and out, or they're, they're not, they're not, we, we end up with a lot of, we can't hear you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do like the, the main value. I mean, there's a lot of values to the studio technologies. The main one is a light. So I can look, I can glance down and see that I am muted or unmuted uh, as a, as a person. <laughs> so that's the, that's the issue there. Um, next question. Nope, I had it in my hand. Uh, next question from myself. Uh, Ventura County, California courtrooms are in the process of incorporating Zoom and other teleconferencing methods into their courtrooms. Is there a digital first future for courtrooms? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, you know, they've been doing this for decades, uh, Mitch. It's uh, a lot of time prisoners come in from prison. <laughs> they don't get them out of their cell and bring them in for arraignments. They go via closed circuit television. They've been doing that since the 60s. So I don't think it's anything new to them. The fact that they may be using Zoom as the transport for those images might be a little different for them. But uh, they're certainly used to it and uh, do it all the time. Go ahead, Jesse. Oh boy, would I dread showing up in court after a day of a judge being forced to look at Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting with terrible audio and terrible picture. The fatigue would set in and it would affect, uh, it would affect outcomes. Go ahead, Bill. I think there's a level at which it makes huge sense. I mean, why send people into traffic court and those minor infraction kinds of things? That should all be handled, I think, virtually like that. When you get into serious criminal matters, though, I don't know if it's going to become super popular because the whole process of having the accused standing before the jury and the rest of that and all the all of what goes into body language and everything else is such a tradition. I don't know if this will end up being the key for high-profile things, but certainly for all the administrative stuff. Please. <laughs> yeah, I would love to come into tra traffic court. Back when I used to get a lot of tickets when I was younger, I would have loved to come in over over uh, over Zoom or something like that rather than have to show up um, every three months <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, anyway, so um, uh, so um, so yeah. So I, I think that I think that for uh, again for traffic tickets for parking tickets whatever those things are, I think that that makes a lot of sense just to not have to deal with that. Um, I think that I, what's interesting will be we we did some design work uh, over COVID. And one of the concerns is really that that gets back and is actually when I really started thinking hard about it is this um, 
you know, lawyers very quickly when they found out we were doing it started asking about their camera systems and everything else because they very quickly realized that looking better and sounding better was going to give them an advantage. You know, and and so they were, you know, suddenly there was this, you know, law firms talking about big cameras and lights and, and studios like within their firms and everything else. As soon as COVID started to look like they were going to come in online, some of them didn't. The older ones, <laughs> some of the older thinking ones uh, were like, oh, I'll just come in over my webcam and, and then they end up as a cat. I'm not a cat. Isn't that, isn't that, wasn't that the people who don't understand it? But the big law firms, uh, uh, the, the larger law firms, ha you know, there's, I worked I used to do legal animation and the law firm that I worked in had its own courtroom for mock, mock trials, like literally full size courtroom in the building, uh, in the law firm. There was, you know, there was 400, um, associates. <laughs> so, 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 so it was, uh, so it was a lot of, it was a big, big law firm. Um, but, uh, but they, uh, they had their own. So law firms like that immediately were going to studios, you know, like, like we're going to build a studio that, that, you know, and, and they were ready to you know, do a shock and awe campaign related to that. Go ahead, uh, uh, Courtney. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to do this all the way down the line for criminal trials where they have the jury coming in via... Uh, I don't think so. Because uh, it's too, really too hard to enforce the rules on a jury is about what they're exposed to, how they're paying attention, what they're using to take notes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that they could even in, uh, in any way enforce any of those jury rule, juror rules uh, over yeah. Zoom, so... Probably not for that. They they actually in, in L.A. They during COVID they postponed all court trials uh, during COVID. They didn't even attempt to do it for a long period of time. Yeah, the, it 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 has been a um, yeah. There's definitely places where it could scale and move things a lot faster if you didn't require people, especially from a carbon footprint perspective, from a time perspective. Lots of lower level things, but as soon as you get into a real trial, I think I agree with everybody here that 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 became that from a security perspective, from privacy perspective, from tampering with a jury, all those things become just really complicated if if they're not all in the same place that you can manage and 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 whether it it really is an issue or not, the real problem you get into is um, is whether people feel like it's fair. You know, that's the, the thing people don't understand is a lot of times is that it doesn't matter whether it is fair, like, like voting or like anything else. It's whether people feel like it's fair. If they stop feeling like it's fair, the whole thing collapses. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, so, so, you know, voting or, or courtrooms or whatever, if people don't feel like it's fair. The whole thing stops working. So they have to feel a lot of what we do in a lot of things in government is to make people feel like things are working the way that they should, um, because that's as important as it actually working. And so I think now one thing that, that has been discussed is bringing is doing tele juries where the jury is still in another courtroom but they're not necessarily in the same uh municipality and the reason for that is if you can't if someone's well known in a, in a location rather than sending everything out they can still have it but they can source the jury from somewhere else and bring them in and that has been discussed i haven't seen it actually done go ahead mitchell yeah, exactly what you just said. Uh, in Ventura County, they're moving juries inside the building or across town um, to be in different uh, parts of the area. But th nothing's going to replace the pomp and circumstance of a courtroom. And that's mm -hmm. what and again, most lawyers. It gets back to how it feels, you know, like and, and, and those things ma matter. Uh, next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida, asking, how can Zoom presenters get feedback like telephone side tone that their voice audio quality is poor other than complaints from meeting attendees? Good, Bill. Well, we do it every day here on Office Hours. And what we've had to do is we've figured out how to use IFBs. You can't really do it very well with open speakers and things like that. And then some kind of a circuit that you build into your Zoom meeting or whatever. Most of us here use Loopback, which is a fine product that allows us to take what we're sending out and bring it back into our IFBs so that we can hear ourselves live. We get a sense of how loud or how soft or whether or not there's something wrong with our microphone. At the same time, the signal goes out to the audience. It's a known technology. You just have to walk down that road and get the right equipment, an IFB and some sort of a patching system that puts the show into your ear, but also allows you to hear yourself. I think he's asking, though, about like just a general person who jumps in, like, how do we tell, how do we show them that they sound like we have ways of doing it so that we know how we sound, <laughs> but it's how do you tell a Yahoo that they're, that they sound horrible? Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Courtney. Well, you know, Zoom, I think, and most computers do have a test thing where it lets you test your microphone, where it records some of uh, your speech, the microphone, then plays it back to you. So you could do that to see how you actually sound. Um, 
And like Bill said, side tone uh, is a way to hear how you're sounding before it gets to Zoom. It doesn't tell you how you're sounding usually after it gets to Zoom because Zoom does not feed your audio back to you. Uh, so I have a mixer that usually have a mixer that provides side tone so I can hear what my mic sounds like so I can hear if I'm popping peas or uh, banging on something that generates noise that goes down the line. Um, but uh, and, and a lot of USB microphones look for a USB microphone if that's all you have has a, a plug for headphones on it and that will generally be driven directly off the microphone and not off the USB return. So look for that. <clears throat> One thing that we've done um, that is abrupt or someone is having some trouble is if you have, if you take loop back and you send it out to audio hijack or you take audio hijack and you just record them on the way out and then you say, Hey, let's listen to your, your audio, especially if you, you have to have a good mic, <laughs> but if you have a good mic and you've been talking to them and then you play their mic back to them, like, we just want you to hear what you sound like. It's a little problematic and just listen for this, 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 and then you play it back to them. Um, you tell them you're going to do it. Like we're going to record a test and we'll play it back to you. So make sure that you're happy with how you sound. Um, especially if they've been talking to you for a couple minutes and you've got a really good mic. Um, the uh, contrast usually is effective at moving things forward. Um, next question. And uh, Courtney Gooden in Hollywood, California, is right here with a question. With Spectrum trying to kill off all TiVos and other non-Spectrum DVRs, I'm considering cutting the cord. What is the panel's suggestion for subscription streaming services to replace the cable channels and premium channels in a single app? Uh, go ahead, uh, Tom. Well, not sure about a single app, but if you want to fine-tune your streaming budget, you want to go to suppose.tv. You put your area in the upper left, you decide what you have to watch, and then it fine-tunes and finds the best bargain out there. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jesse. Hands down, the best streaming service I've ever used is not one. It's DVD.com, and it's great because it is studio agnostic. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. I have been a DirecTV customer since 1994 when it was called Hughes DirecTV, and I'm doing everything I can to cut the cord with it uh, by practicing uh, using something else. And I will tell you that you, Apple TV can do 99% of ev everything you want. So I'm getting used to by using Apple TV. Like the other day, I wanted to watch CNN Live. Well, there's an app for that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, Jason. Um, with the exception of a brief stint as a Nielsen household, I have never, ever had cable television, not as a kid, not as an adult, ever. Um, I think that the quality of your viewership goes way up when you realize that um, you can just buy a season of something you actually want. And at that point, um, it, it's actually a lot more enjoyable instead of just having, a, having something that drones on. Uh, Courtney? Yeah, well, now that uh, uh, things are on demand, uh, that you know you can <clears throat> you don't have to DVR a lot of stuff anymore because you can pull it in on demand. I like the fact that I could DVR something and skip commercials for commercial broadcast stuff for the non-premium channels. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I've been you know I have uh, HBO Plus and Showtime Anytime and you know all those, but they're all separate apps that I have to have on a Fire TV or whatever my streaming stick is. Um, the problem is I'm looking for something to consolidate all those in one place so I could DVR them, uh, premium channels, regular channels, uh, cable channels, and over the air. I have an over the air tuner that has a DVR and that works very good. Uh, but it's just the over the air live broadcast channels. It doesn't include any of the cable network channels. So I was trying to find something like Hulu or some streaming service that could incorporate in those premium channels uh, from other services, but I haven't found anything yet. I'll have to, I'll look for the DVD. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for that uh, comment uh, to see if that uh, consolidates a bunch of uh, or is agnostic to streaming sources. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, I use YouTube TV almost exclusively for everything outside of. I mean, I have the streaming service, some of the streaming services, and you can do that. But for DVR. It's so much better than any DVR I've ever seen that I, because I just tell it to record everything. <laughs> just, just I see things coming up and I just, uh, I record everything and, and it's always there and I can always go back and I record so many things that I forget about it. And then I go, oh yeah, the, this is in 60 minutes. I think I'll go watch that. And it's there because I record, I set it on like, you know, record forever um, because it's just metadata. Um, and I just have to say that that's really addicting, <laughs> you know, and, and after that. <laughs> 
And the guys at YouTube are going, hey, this Alex Lindsay guy is using up 500 terabytes of DX. The funny thing is, see, the, that's the best really part of YouTube is thing, yeah. they're not recording it. It's yeah. just in and out points. You know, all they're sa saving is the in and out Well, points. they have to record everything in case somebody like you wants to see it streaming. Well, they do record now, everything. There's so enough people yeah, that, that do it. They, they record everything. Everything's on DVR like like YouTube. And uh, they just take the, the technology there. And and uh, it is it is the, I mean, yeah. Because I do, you know, again, I want to go back and look at a bunch of lower thirds or a bunch of super sources or I want to go back and watch some game or, or something that or some pieces of it. Like when there was a question yesterday about the Oscars and or not the Oscars, the Grammys, uh, you know, whatever, some uh, event thing, thing uh, 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 <laughs> something with little statues. Um, and uh, someone asked uh, about it. I didn't watch the, I didn't watch the Grammys. But I had set it to record at some point in time in the past. <laughs> so so I was able to just kind of pick, pick it. I probably last year I said, record this forever. And and so I just went back and started skipping through it and, uh, you know, was able to be ready for the show. So that's, it's really, uh, it's pretty great. Next question. Next one in from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone have a recommendation for a briefcase that turns into a table or a desk? Trying to set up a portable system with screen and lid that opens, folds out, and mic flips up camera and ready to broadcast. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, I had one once upon a time when I was doing a ton of traveling. It was, And I, I wish I could have looked it up. I didn't have time to do that this morning. But... Um, what it was was a small tabletop, and I say small because it's suitable for a laptop, not much more than that, and it had aluminum legs underneath it, and it fit in a briefcase. And so when I had to spend lots of time in an airport, I could actually take out this rig and type on it. The thing to do is look for travel table. Do a search on, on Google or one of the big searches for that. You should find some of these rigs that are small enough to fit into a briefcase and yet will come out to be something that you could work on for an hour and and not mess your back up. Next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. NBC used Twitter to give viewers an inside look at the Olympics graphics team. How can you take community members behind the scenes without making your staff feel uncomfortable? It's so worth it. Like you, you just have to figure out if the staff's willing to do it, but you know, a lot of a lot of staff want to want to be seen, <laughs> so they didn't never get to see. They're they're kind of hidden in the background. They just have to watch their language. <laughs> That's usually the, the biggest thing of how they talk about things is usually the thing they have to tighten up. But outside of that, most people like to show off. Now, um, next question. Next one in from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Seawater split to produce green hydrogen. Can we look forward to throwing away our batteries someday? But probably not. Not tomorrow. Not, maybe not in our lifetime. <laughs> so, so I, I think that the batteries are important in the sense that the whatever you're splitting, I think eventually is going to be going back to a battery. You know, like I think mostly what batteries do is stabilize all the green energy that we have um, to allow it. But then it's not the batteries themselves aren't that green. Um, so it's just a, it's a complicated problem. I think that we'll get to watch a pretty incredible change in power over the next in our in most of our lifetimes, but probably won't get to where we think it should um, in our lifetime. Next question. And here's Chris again asking, uh, Toveriches, what is your personal most used social media platform currently? Twitter, Instagram, Zoom, or Facebook? Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I think that by time, I would probably say Zoom, uh, and, then, and then probably after that Discord, and then after that Twitter. Go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, so for me, it's uh, YouTube, uh, hands down, and then Zoom. And Facebook is, uh, mostly for me, Facebook is keeping up with my uh, local friends. Uh, and then, of course, people around like uh, John Predor and, and people like that. Uh, so, but, uh, and then a lot of these others are just basically uh, side, side social networks from there. I go recording. Uh, none of the above mentioned. I'm on the antisocial network. I think Discord <laughs> is a good uh, is a good choice uh, to keep groups of people together of common interests, and you can uh, DM each other, and it's uh, a private. It's uh, not public, so uh, you don't run into problems with the press snooping on you, things like that. I'm 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 trying to think about what an antisocial network would be. Would that was be, the most you know, Dvorak thing I've of, ever heard of, you say. Of hearts, it would just be like there'd just be a big thing that just said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so just little skill and crossbones yeah, for the exactly. guy. Yeah, Tom, real quick. 
Yeah, Discord plus one. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, John. I, I say wherever your community is, because Twitter's no good if you have no community, if you're not following anybody. So wherever your community is, that's your that's your social network. Yeah, next question. Ethan Tor- uh, Kordiaka from Hamilton, Canada, has a question. I had a few digital conferences and one in person. Ask about having a podcast series released as part of the conference, or one of the sessions is an actual walking session, and attendees choose the podcast they want to listen to. Anyone else seeing this? I definitely think that releasing audio versions of your of your sessions makes a lot of sense, um, and so we're. Um, uh, we are finally talking um, to, to to about um, someone. Someone in, in our community said, "Hey, can I? I you know, I want to listen to this stuff." And I was like, "Well, why don't we make a podcast?" So we may make a podcast of all these shows, so people can just subscribe and download them rather than having to go somewhere else to do that. So, um, uh, so, so I think that that is. Uh, I think making them available on video makes it or audio makes a ton of sense uh, for the sessions, especially if everyone just sitting around talking. So um, uh, we haven't had a lot of requests for it yet, but I bet you it, it's going to start coming up because it just makes it makes a ton of sense not to sit there and watch it if you're not interacting with the audience. If you are, then you want to be there. Um, next question. Roddy Hofsey from Tromsø, Norway, asking, Ecamm Live is nice to use and a new version is awesome, but we need to be able to companion it. By the way, companioning something is to have absolute two-way remote control over it. Should we join in and crowdsource some cash to get the module developed? I guess I would say companion is a, it seems like a difficult platform. <laughs> like, like I, and when I talk to people who use, who are, you know, working on things for companion, the update and the way it works and how, how that process works. Um, it's, it, it has all the idiosyncrasies of a, of a uh, open source project, um, you know, that there's not, it's kind of diffused as far as responsibility. Uh, I don't think that, I don't think I would, I think I would just be happy when it shows up because I don't, I think I'd just get too frustrated if I was trying to push it down the path into companion. Um, next question. James Haldane in Vancouver, Canada. Is there an easy method for 10 individuals to recite an oath together on Zoom? Any tips? I go, Jeffrey. It depends on if you need to hear the words that they're saying. Uh, if that's the case, then they, you need to do it individually if you're going through a Zoom. What I would ultimately do if you don't need to hear them say word for word what they're talking about uh, is to put up a screen that has the text that you want them to recite and then have them turn off their headphones, their speakers, and then do the recite at their own pace. Uh, that way that way, they're not getting tripped up by somebody else talking. And Because like when we do the happy birthday, you'll notice... As we're singing, we start to slow down because we're hearing other people singing and then we're trying to match their tones. And that's that's where you, you run into the big problem. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, even in live situations where people are taking an oath and you've got fee, you know, 10 people raising their hand and repeat repeat after me, they, they're not dur- completely in sync. So I don't think it's really going to matter and has been proved by a singing happy birthday. You'll never be able to make anything sync up exactly because <laughs> in Zoom, you know. Uh, the, yeah, one one thing to remember is that the that you're only getting three channels at a time from the reflector. So if everybody talks, you only get three of them. Um, so until they have a local record, um, which Zoom has already announced, uh, then you could get everybody to say it and it would upload the file and then you'd have a picture of them saying it. So um, that's probably, you know, double ending that recording is probably one of the things that'll be important to make that actually work. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, in an article about the infrastructure for the 2021 Grammys, they talked about a dedicated music mixing truck with a Lavo MC2 console. What makes the MC2 console the choice for said task? I've heard they're more popular in Europe than the U.S. I'll tell you a secret. It was because that was what was in the truck. <laughs> like we, we, we can have it like, like there, like it was something it was, it was probably specced by the, the audio engineer or, it, or they were just told that's what we have in the truck that we have. Uh, you know, uh, La, uh, Lavo is, is really popular. Uh, Calrec, um, Digico, those all, all would have done the job. Um, but, uh, but it's probably just because it was in the truck. Next question. Ronnie Hofsey in Romso, excuse me, Tromso, Norway. What to put in a drawer of a fly pack for those just-in-case situations? No pun intended. Uh, go ahead, Jesse. We go Noah's Ark on audio couplers. So uh, two mini to RCAs, two RCAs to mini to mini to mini. Just every possible variant of, of audio coupler that you can imagine and two of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, John. 
In my drawer, I have a Leatherman and a flashlight and my fold-up gray card. Uh, Mitchell? Turnarounds and decimators. And uh, uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, if you are flying, it's very important to, if, if you're doing a Leatherman to make sure that it's in the checked bag as opposed to what you're carrying on the plane. Uh, but for uh, for me, the biggest one, since I do a lot of use a lot of network, is a crossover. It's a little crossover cable adapter. That way I can go from Ethernet to Ethernet into uh, computer to computer so I can do some self-configuration if needed. Good, Bill. A roll of good gray gaff tape and a roll of white board tape and a Sharpie. Courtney? Yeah, tape's important. And also, like everybody else, uh, I have a con- a uh, connector, I mean, a container that has every type of adapter known to mankind, you know, XLR to, you know, quarter inch, eighth inch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, decimators, MDHXs, a couple of those always, and some extra power supplies that have variable, uh, variable connectors on the end, barrel connectors, and variable voltages so that if you have a power supply, a little wall wart blow, you have a backup universal wall wart that you can pop into place. All of those things. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael here asking, Alex, you mentioned the behind-the-scenes documentary as a use case for fan-submitted video of a band. When editing documentary projects, is the traditional paper edit and script creation process still useful? Good, Bill. Absolutely. Everything that you can do to organize yourself before you dive into the actual process is useful. And I, for most of us, even as we get more electronic, having some sort of process for getting our thoughts down, um, you know, it is changing a little bit. And I will admit, since I learned Final Cut, I, I have my thought process for getting ready for complex video edits has changed a little bit because I can attach keywords to things. So there is a certain freedom to knowing that if I do my organization that way well in the middle of the edit when i'm in the moment trying to solve a problem with the edit i can bring to me subsets of my footage down to the frame and uh, bring up what i think i need means that i don't have to have some of those old uh three by five cards or structural things that i might have done beforehand but still Every hour I spend in planning, whether it's actually doing a formal paper edit or putting three by five cards or using a whiteboard to structure things, it all goes into the process of of clarifying your thoughts and giving you the best opportunity, making the best show you can. And I think we're going to, I think we got to the end of our questions a little bit faster than, well, we got a couple more general questions floating around. We could probably answer another one or two. Um, do we, I don't know why they're not moving forward, but we, <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, go ahead. Next question. Um, not seen general. It's, Let's there see. There's an alpha channel question. Oh, no, um, no, from... There should be a general one. Hold on. Yeah. For the folks in the back end, we have to keep up with that if we're not at the top of the hour. Um, anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, I've got it. Oh, oh no, nope, not anymore. <laughs> Sorry. No, they're just jumping around, so Hold I can't help you. Hold on a second. Um, okay, I need folks in the back end to stop moving. Just let, let me let me move things around a little bit. All right, last question. All right, Douglas Carmichael, my M2 Pro Mac Mini has finally shipped. What audio video software would show off the performance of Apple Silicon Best? I'm coming from a 2013 Mac Pro. Yo, Jason. Absolutely anything. <laughs> well, I mean, Excel is not is going to run as fast as it ever ran. A um, 2013. Do you remember how slow a 2013 <laughs> Mac was with a mechanical know. hard drive? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that anything, if you if you open up something where you throw a bunch of, um, if you end up throwing a bunch of uh, filters at something, um, 3D inside of motion, um, the things that really you'll will still nail your, uh, anything that you buy is, you know, open up Metashape and throw something, throw 50 photos in there and tell it to go highest quality. And you'll see how, how many processors you, it, it has because it'll turn them all up to, you know, so you can compare one to the other. You'll probably find that the meta shape on the new computer that you just bought is probably ten to twenty times faster than um, than what you had on a twenty thirteen uh, Mac Pro. So uh, and that's a good one. That's a pretty easy one for you to 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 run the stress test on. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So uh, and and Douglas, I know you're you're into the synthesizers. So did basically just pull up any of the synthesizer programs and uh, get the plugins and just start piling on plugins and and see how how far you can go with that. Uh, Push them to the distance to see uh, 
see what kinds of sounds you can get out of them. All right. We are now changing subjects to uh, to our second hour and talking a little bit about alpha channels. And this will be a, you know, I, I've got a couple different things to show depending on how many questions we end up with. Um, but we want to kind of talk through it. And I want to explain the most important thing, I think, is for people to see what an alpha channel is actually doing. Because one of the things that makes alpha channels complicated is that a lot of our apps do it automatically. They show a little checkerboard behind it. The, you, you load in a ping and it's just like, oh, there it is. It has an alpha channel. And understanding exactly what that alpha channel is doing is, is really, really important um, to figure it out. So um, mechanically, let me, I'm gonna show you, and again, this will be, we've got some good folks here with a lot of expertise. So a lot of it'll be for you to ask questions about the alpha channel. My demo is not very long, <laughs> so so it's going to be um, just to just to really show you um, you know what what happens here. So, uh, and I'm going to have to screen share because I don't have Photoshop on my uh, on my other computer. So I'm um, because you know I had to rent it um, anyway. Not that I'm bitter. Um, so uh, let's see here. So let me turn this on. And we'll go to desktop two. All right. So. Um, now you now hopefully you all can see um, Photoshop here. So okay. here's what I have here is I have, you know, some text called alpha, but it's over black and I've got a background that I made in mid journey. And I want to put just the alpha over top of it. Now, what I also have is I was able to render out a black and white image. So this is what we typically used to call a mat. And the reason that we called it a mat is because we actually it used to cut mats <laughs> to do this. Like, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what we call things are, um, you know, are, are there because we, we were, um, they, they meant something in the past. And so this is, this is the mat for that. What that means is that where it's white, I want the, my, whatever I'm, I have there where it's black, I want to have the background. Now, how does it do that? And I think that understanding how it does, it changes the way you think about these things. So what this does is I take the mat and I'm going to copy it once. So now I have two of those mats and I'm going to move one mat down over top of my background. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to take this mat and this is the crazy thing about alpha channels in general, very basic math, not math that you, math that you knew by the time you were hopefully in second or third grade, you're going to multiply. So you're literally taking that mat and multiplying it to the background. Oops, I'm sorry, invert it first. So we're going to invert it and then multiply it. So um, so you'll see, I'm gonna go back to what I had here. All I did was invert this mat. So I have the opposite of that mat, and then I'm gonna multiply it. What multiply does, and this is important, is um, multiply says, I'm going to multiply the pixel value against uh, the two pixel values together. And so it's, it's important because you start thinking about these things. So what is black? It's zero. What is white? It's one. So I'm multiplying, and you don't want to think about the thing that people think about is they they have a hard time thinking about pixel math. So we'll go in here. We're not talking about all the pixels one or zero. We're talking about this pixel. This pixel is zero. This pixel is one, and this is some kind of gray value in between. But the bottom line is is that this is a when you you want to think zero to one, and this pixel is so what and how how all of these compositing programs do what we call pixel math is it's just the pixel above and below. So when you do a composite of, of add or subtract or multiply or hard light, it's a mathematical equation for this pixel to the pixel below it. And so that's the thing that you want to, um, you want to think about. It's, it's literally, and it's doing it for all of these. Um, when you blur, we use something called convolution kernels, which is that it looks at the pixels around it, and then it, it has another math equation that it does, that it uses. So this is pixel math, and it's multiplying zero, and that means that um, zero times anything will be zero. <laughs> like so, it's and and white and one times anything will be the, exactly what it was before. So that mathematically is how this is actually happening. So if we back up here and we multiply again, the things that were zero, so we'll go into multiply. The things that were zero are are now black, and the, and where it was white is now exactly the way it was before. Like that's all you're that's all you're trying to to produce there. Um, now the second one that we're going to take, we have this, and if we put this over top, it doesn't mean anything yet. So what we're going to do is we'll take this and we'll group it to the one below it, and we'll select it and we'll say multiply there. So now we have multiplied um, this mat, and this is oftentimes what we call pre-multiplication, um, but we're gonna we multiply the mat um, to, the, to the background there. And now we're simply, we're gonna screen it, which is close to add. Um, and uh, 
uh, and Photoshop in their infinite wisdom took ad out of, out of the calculations, which is a little annoying. Um, uh, so, uh, that is, so now what you have is that composite now, because what it did is it's when it says, see, we, we, we knocked a hole out. So we matted that hole out of where it needed to go in. And then we, um, and then we added a, and then we added that back in. And because this, this one here is all black now, and, and this is an important piece here too, is so you'll notice that I didn't need, see how I, when I turn this layer off, because I pre-multiplied that black to the background, I didn't actually need to punch out the foreground. The reason that that's important to understand is this is why you have to always pre-multiply anything that you send to a, um, uh, to uh, anything that you send out um, uh, to a black magic switcher because what the black magic switcher doesn't do this last calculation <laughs> it doesn't punch the hole out of the foreground um, because it saves uh, cpu time and so uh, that's why when when you say you want to pre-multiply by pre-multiplying we didn't need to knock that out if if this background was over white um so if i uh you know if if this oops, if this background was over white i would need to punch that out to make that actually work um so so anyway so but understanding how that math uh um, you know, works is is the very basics of how alpha channels work. And of course, if there's portions of gray, um, then you, uh, you know, then you start to see semi-transparency because it's the gray 0.5 times whatever was behind it. Now, I know that Bo has a couple things to show as well. So I'll let Bo, I'll let jump, Bo jump in. Oh, Did I surprise you, you there? <laughs> I, just, I just, I I was like, I was looking one way and then I just threw the ball, threw the ball at, 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 at Bo. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Didn't set yeah, up at no, all. No, I I just wanted to show it from a kind of a different perspective, from the perspective of like a traditional broadcast CG, um, so like an expression or a uh, Chiron that you might find in a TV station. Um, so basically, this is just a you know it's a hardware computer, um, and it splits the the key channel out or the alpha channel out just on a separate SDI feed. So out of the back of this computer that I'm about to show you, which is a, an expression. Um, it's it's going to split out the, the fill in the key just on separate SDI feeds. So I'll show you the lower third first. This is a very simple lower third. Brings it in, brings it out. Then if I were to show you what's happening behind the scenes, so you can see this quad box. Top left is the, the fill channel. Top right is the key channel. So you can just see that, like Alex was saying, the key is just the black and white that, that tells the switcher what to punch out and uh, or allow to you know show through. So, and play that a couple the, times. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, so that, so that you can see the alpha channel popping up there, and and that is really the. I mean, that is the whole of it. <laughs> you know, like it's not it's not a complicated thing. But I think that a lot of times people, when they think about alpha channels, they're not understanding what the alpha channel is actually doing. And when we understand that alpha channel, um, it it allows us to do a lot of things as we start to think about. Uh, you know, what we're, what we're actually producing. So for instance, if we just know that we're, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to key something out. Like I want to pull something out of a, a background and they're trying to figure out how to do that. And it might not have a green screen. It might not have something else. So I'll show you a little bit of a, let me go back to my, uh, my screen share. Did Bo, did you, was that, did you have more to, more graphics there? No. Well, that's pretty much it. I can show you, yeah. you know, where in the switcher you can assign the key channel. Um, yep. Yep. You know, so in the switcher software, uh, you're basically my input. But oh, we lost you, Bo. Lost your audio there. That's why you don't use a spacebar for for mute. <laughs> uh, the so you can see here on a, on my switcher settings, my expression channel one is uh, is input five, and then you're telling the switcher that the alpha for that that fill signal is this. Uh, which is BNC six, which is the key ch the key signal out of the expression box. So, um, you know, it's it's pretty simple to set up, and and then it just works. Yeah, and and the main thing is is that so you have your you know the, the thing to understand is that when you understand what that looks like now, another thing that um, that a lot of us have have done in the past is to do things like a, when we talk about a Luma key. The Luma key is doing exactly what you're talking about, except it's just simply looking at the Luma values of your uh, of your image. And so you have, it just looks at the Luma values. And what a lot of times we can do is actually have black over 
a background and, 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 and make that actually work. And what I mean by that is that you, you can put a white, if I put something, I'll try to put it together as we're doing the answer, the questions, but as you can basically just, because you, when you understand Luma, how alpha channels work, you understand that the Luma key is just taking the Luma values of your foreground image and just, and you're basically setting a place to knock them out um, to make that actually work. So um, I'll show you a little bit of extracting things out of, out of uh, you know, when you understand that an alpha channel is just this black and white image that you're trying to get rid of. Um, let me uh, let me pop this up. So you'll see this um, this little dude here. Um, this is my little troll that I built in in uh, in, in, in Mid Journey. Um, anyway, so uh, so you have this here, and this is where people start to get a little bit concerned because they're looking at it and going, "Well, I you know this isn't over green. This isn't it doesn't have a, a selection. Like, how do I get all the detail out of here?" And when you understand what you're doing um, to make this actually work, this starts to become something that's a little bit more straightforward. So the first thing that oftentimes a lot of us will do is start to separate these things out. So the reason I'm using Photoshop is because it has channels and other things don't have channels. So um, one of the things that there's old, an old fashioned thing that's hidden inside of uh, Photoshop called calculations, and you won't see it on that screen capture, but under image, there's a thing called calculations, which have been there since the dawn of Photoshop. Um, so you can say, I want to take the red channel and I want to um, typically multiply it to the blue channel uh, or I can look through green, red, green, and blue. Um, so I can look at what these are and I can, and you can see how it made him darker, but it didn't really affect the background dramatically, you know, in that area. So I'm looking for what am I going to get the most contrast out of there? And so I'll say, I want to make a new channel. So now it's created this new alpha channel that's that's there. And I might even want to do that again. I'll do another calculation so I can incorporate the blue channel. So I'll say, I want to take the alpha channel and multiply it to the blue channel. And so now I've kind of darkened up all of this stuff here. And now what I'm going to do is say, okay, I'm going to grab this channel. And the first thing I'm going to do is start to do what we call kind of divide and conquer. So um, you know, we're going to do a polygonal lasso here and I'll go, uh, I might want some of this down here. So I'm just going to, um, we'll select this. One of the things that people, when they think about alpha channels is they think about having to key the whole image and what you want to try to avoid. The only thing you're really keen are the edges. You're not, and you can do this in video as well. I'm doing it in a still, but you could do it in video. Um, so we'll just do this here like this and we'll select all of that and we will make that white. Doesn't matter. doesn't match up. It's just, I don't want to think about that anymore. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here into the core and I'm going to do a build what I call a core mat or what not I call, but people call a core mat. Um, and we won't get everything in here. We're just going to get all the major stuff. We know that we're going to have to deal with his toes by themselves. Um, but what this is going to do is it means that stuff like his icon, his eyes and everything else, I don't want to deal with that either. So we'll do this and then we'll knock it to black. So now we've started to go down that path. And what we're going to do here is start to use the um, uh, the eyedropper tool. And this is in a different configuration because it's a new version of Photoshop. Thank you. Um, dodge tool. And I'll make it a little bit bigger. And um, usually I'll set that exposure a little higher for the beginning. Now it's set to highlight, so it's going to have less effect on the stuff that's around it. So I'm going to start to paint around this. And what you're going to notice because it's set to highlight, it doesn't, if, I, if I'm careful with the hair, I'm not going to lose, I'll lose a little bit of it. But I'm doing this by hand. Now you can, there's a lot of ways to, to try to extract it, building something out of, out of a uh, still out of this, but you'll see how I'm starting to pull that de detail out um, of the areas that I'm kind of just going through quickly. And and you want to be gentle with it in that area here that's there. And then a lot of times what you're going to do is you're going to, and this is a little bit back and forth, but what you, when you understand what you're doing with these things, um, you start to understand all I'm doing is just taking an image and I'm just trying to extract, you know, the, the information that I, that I need out of this. So I turned down the, my, my thing and I'm just pushing those highlights very gently to where they need to be. And so I'm extracting that out of a gray, you know, it's gray on gray and nothing is pure. And I'm still able to get a lot of that hair detail back that I was looking for there. I can do this a little bit. This is gonna be tricky down there. We have to decide how much of the, of his, you know, how much of his shadow we wanna keep 
you know, here. And, and I may fade it out because it went off the screen. So I may fade that out a little bit. I might keep a little bit of that drop shadow in there. I can decide to get rid of it if I want. But you can see how I'm kind of knocking out all of the, the information there to, to, to make that work. And now, now what I'm going to do is go in and I'm going to go into the burn tool. And I'm going to burn this stuff back in. So the burn tool is going to let me push everything to black. And I should push this. This is set to shadows up here, you can see. And I can probably make this a little bit more aggressive just to, for speed. I might make it a little less if I was doing this for a show. But now what I'm doing is I'm pushing all of that, all those things that were kind of black, all the way to black. But it's not, I don't have to be right on the edge. I think a lot of people feel like they have to create a selection to do this. And if you understand how these alpha channels work and you understand that I can just paint inside of this and, you know, get the information that I want, um, it gets to be a lot easier to make that actually happen. So now I've got, you know, most of what I need here. His toes are the only place that probably going to have, you know, some trouble because those are pure white. So a lot of times you're going to end up going in here and I'm going to select my burn tool again and I can burn some of this down. Yeah, yeah. Where is it? Oh, I hate the clone tool. It's not the burn tool. And, you know, again, you use the tools that you have in front of you. So you can basically what you can do here is I can then just select. So a lot of the stuff is done in pieces. You use the tools that what what hard is really doing the edges. So that's the thing that you try to. Um, so you can see that you did that. And then I'll just do the same thing over here. So now what I'm doing though, is I've taken an image that was rendered out of uh, an image without a green screen, because trying to get it to do green screen is difficult. And I could go back and paint that little toe in, um, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Oops. So now you have this kind of, you know, work through it. I can look at it here. Um, I might look back here and go, oh, it might need a little more. So I'll just go in here and dodge and just kind of make sure I kind of clean this up a little bit. Um, to make sure that, that there's really no, no issues there. So now you can kind of see that, oops, let's grab this. And this is good enough for now. I'd probably spend a little bit more time on it, making it a little bit better if I needed to. So now I have this, now I've re been able to recreate an alpha channel. Now I need to reinsert it. And, and understanding these alphas and understanding how to do the calculations and how to put those together uh, means that you're able to kind of, you know, make that actually work. So I can invert this. And when I see this, when I inverted it, sometimes some things start to show up like I missed a couple spots. And so I can go through here and go, well, I, you know, I, I'd like to go back to the dodge tool because now I'm going the other direction and just kind of clean up a couple things that I saw there. Um, I might see, you know, this little area right there needs to be pulled in. Um, there's a little bit of, a little bit of schmutz there. Uh, it's a technical term that we use, schmutz. Um, and then we have, um, and then we have the burn, burn tool. And I feel like, um, Feel like uh, little happy clouds, you know. It's just like little, just painting out the little semi-transparencies, little happy clouds. All right, so, that, so there you have the, your your dude. And um, now, if I just hold down my command key and click on it, I can go into the layers and hit J, Command J, which is going to float float him up. I don't know why it doesn't do it in the first one, but there he is with his transparency. And if I add a background to it, um, to a, a do. A, Add a background, put it back there. And now he's sitting over white. So before he was here, right? And that I couldn't use in my presentation, but I can simply now pop that in and he's now, you know, been keyed over. I still have a little bit. Of, I could probably go back and again, work on the toes a little bit if I wanted to. Um, but really when you start, when you understand how it works, how the alpha channels work and you're trying to pull together elements, um, the, uh, I, I have to, I'm doing a presentation right now where I have lots and lots of these. And what I did is I, you know, I'm using, I'm using, uh, um, uh, mid journey to build a lot of little examples of things. And I just said over white, but it doesn't, mid journey doesn't know how to do that like perfectly. So it does all these little gradients and everything else. And you can just knock this stuff out really, really fast, um, as examples and everything else. And so anyway, that's the, um, but when you understand what the black, what you're doing with that black and white, it makes a, it makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Bo, did you have something else? 
Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Um, it, it, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it, it's good demo. I like that. Um, it's funny because the methodology that I use is maybe a little more brute force. I do the garbage mat on uh, um, what you're doing, but I would have gone into curves and uh, brute forced a lot of that um, painting detail that you and, were doing. And you, and you would have had a hard time getting the hair. The hair, except for the hair, you know, and like to treat it separately. The problem is, is that too many of those things were too close together. And so if you started using curves to do all those things, you would have had a hard time extracting it. And, um, you know, that's, and that's the key is to think about, especially with keys, whether it's, whether you're using green screen or you, and we'll do another one on green screen, but whether you're doing that or not, understanding that all you're doing is building this black and white map and the, you know, and, and the semi-transparencies are given when you understand what you're doing, you can use all kinds of tools and figure out how you're going to peel it back. Go ahead, Jeffrey. So, yeah, I did a lot of this when Facebook first came out with their uh, 3D photos, because if you put an alpha mat together with the photo and then because they didn't have an easy way to do it on Android, I think it was. So there was a way to actually upload both pictures and it would do the merge from there. A little tip that I found was that you can also in Photoshop convert from an RGB photo to a CMYK. That way, if you have a lot of color, a lot of uh, little details, then you could separate it out a little bit better. Yeah, that actually can can work as ju jumping in. I mean, sometimes we'll jump into all kinds of different channels. There's a bunch of different ones. There's HLS, there's there's uh, CMYK, there's a bunch of different math, and sometimes changing what, the, what channels are available to you 100% makes a difference. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. If you were to put in a, a background image of like a beach scene or a mountain scene, something other than a continuous color background like black or white, does it show off uh, the, any errors in your alpha channel so it makes it look more like a pasted on image or? It may, you, you know, one thing to get back into it, the alpha channel will get you most of the way there. Um, let's try it. Let's uh, put this guy in here. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, you can't see it. Give me one second here. Let me. Um, so you will see, you, you know, you have to do some edge work after that, you know, to figure that out. Um, but let me, I'll show you what, what, where, where we're at here. Um, doo, doo, doo. So if I give you this here, he is over top of that background that we showed earlier. So you are going to see, you know, some, because we pulled him out of gray, you know, you're going to see him, you're going to see a little bit of edges there. And that's where you're going to have to start doing kind of fringe selection. And you may, you know, go in and start to work on, you know, either pulling it in or or selecting that information um, to to make that work. But once you and it's also depends on what you know what he. Um, uh, let's see here. We can make it. Yeah, I can see areas in the hair there where it's yeah. holding holding the background out, so it looks unusually gray instead of seeing the background through it. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, oops, and we might like want to put him somewhere so we you know make him smaller him in here he's angry um the other thing that you end up with as you start to do this is and so you'll it all depends on what you have in the background there you know to, to to decide what what makes sense but you'll also notice that like for instance this doesn't work you know here so then you may end up you know doing something where you grab that alpha channel um, and the way that a lot of times we would do something like this is we might grab this is going to be really brute force but um but i'll, I'll grab this section here um, and then I will, um, I'll float that. I'll select it again and uh, delete it. Hit delete. So now if I turn that off, eh, hold on. Let's do that again. So I, I have that selected um, with what he's got there. And I'm going to, um, I will I'm gonna copy him. Because what I did there is it, it selected it. It only did the transparency when I when I bumped up. We'll just do it twice so just to make it easier. So we'll do this, but then I will do that again. Uh, there's a faster way to do that, but I, I'm going to just do it this way for now. And I'll, in the lower one, I'll hit delete. You still, you'll still see it there. So there, there it is. But now I have this there. Now I can set this layer mask to something else like multiply. Um, so sometimes you're you're wanting to separate that out so that you can. So what we did here is we multiplied it instead of having it just matched over top. Um, you know we can also do things like um, go in here and you know in our selection 
um, you know, we can uh, make a selection of him and grab that and go. And this is probably going to be a longer <laughs> thing, but um, uh, you can. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find the right selection here, but you can start, you know, grabbing the the uh, the edges, um, and we can start. Anyway, there's a lot. It's a lot here that I just there's a a new set of interfaces that I'm not as familiar with. So we're gonna. I'm going to keep moving back, back to it. So, um, but yeah, what you do is you get into the fringe and again, you're going to start building interact inter relationships. So, uh, this is probably something that it's all like light wrap is probably a whole nother second hour, but, but basically what you do is you create a, another alpha channel that's on the inside and on the outside, and then you can use it to blend the background in. And I'll try to put that together while someone else is answering the question. Go ahead, Bo. Uh, just following up on what Courtney was asking. I was a lot of times when you get to this step, um, just to make sure you've gotten all the schmutz, uh, I'll just apply like an obnoxious green outline so you can see, yeah. you know, you can really see in, in the, you know, background if anything's still there that you can't really notice. Absolutely. And li or I'll, to, I'll do a um, levels call and just push it way hard, you know, on the, on the alpha channel and then everything kind of pops out, you know, so that you catch it. Um, go ahead, Mitchell. And you can tell a uh, professional like yourself how you're doing it was your divide and conquer point of view is uh, exactly right because... The, uh, the way you treat the edges around his shoulders and jacket are going to be completely different than the way you're going to treat the hair. So you might draw a, um, a mat around the areas on the edge of the hair so that you can adjust the opacity and uh, the, uh, so it doesn't stick out like Courtney was saying quite so much. And it's always a matter of fidgeting with it completely and constantly. Yeah, and, you know, there's, there are things that you may... Um... Yeah, there's there's a lot of things that you 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 might be able to do. We can kind of freeform a little bit with this. If I, uh, well, we'll go we'll, we'll go to the first question and then we'll come back to this um, next question. First question in from Morgan Price from Victoria, British Columbia. Thinking about getting graphics with Alpha over live video into Zoom for teaching. What are the pros and cons for using key and fill into an ATEM versus overlaying in software after the ATEM? Uh, stability. So, I mean, I think that that's the big, um, the, the big advantage there is stability of, of when you, so what you're talking about is the question is, is do you do your cut and then have some kind of software that's going to add a graphic and then go in and you're going to, the thing you're going to pay for with this, this process is latency and stability. So it's going to, you're going to lose a couple more frames of compositing going through OBS or going through something else, um, to add that graphic or memo. Um, you're going to lose some, some, uh, some frames. So, so latency is going to be more of a problem. Also, if something happens here, now you're toast. <laughs> you know? and, and so, and the reality is, is that <clears throat> it's so easy to do. Um, again, think about the reason we use key, key fill is the reason that Bo showed, which is that we have something animated rolling up. Um, when you start thinking about this, think about whether you want to do it with, um, whether you need that or not. You know, do I need to have something that has, um, you know, and we can cut the bow again and he can kind of show that. When you have something animating, it makes sense for you to, um, it makes sense for you to have the key fill there potentially. Um, we've even done ones with Luma Key, which we can talk about another another moment. But but the the main thing is, is that if you're just doing a still or if you're doing a very short sequence, these are all things that can be done with the ATEM. Now, the ATEM... Um, depending on the size of your ATEM, depends on how many frames you have to work with. For instance, the what what Bo showed here is fast enough that if you put that into um, an ATEM, uh, one of the larger ATEMs, you could just put the whole sequence into it and it would just play it out. The problem is it doesn't have very many of those sequences and they're not dynamic. So the advantage that Bo has, because you're using expressions there, right, Bo? Um, yeah, so the advantage that he has is he's outputting that, that uh, um, you know, he's outputting that and he can change what's there and the, and the system is, is dynamically generating them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, he, the system is dynamically deciding what it's going to send out as a key fill. But if you're doing something for training, the other thing to remember is, is that I would really, for the most part, unless you're really good at doing animations, um, the less, less is more, you know? And so I would, I would recommend thinking about stills that just pop up you know, that, that do, do what you needed to do. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, and, you know, again, I don't know if we're going to get to it today, but we can talk about get using something like key, maybe an, an, I wanted to kind of talk through alpha channels a little bit here. There'll probably be another second hour that we talk about like how to key into an ATEM 
is probably down the, down the road where we talk about the different ways to do that. So that's probably a whole second hour on its own. We needed to understand what alpha channels were and how we approach them first. Um, but, but I think that um, specifically with a switcher or, or an ATEM using Luma key versus green screen versus, and I think that we can probably break that down into its own, its own space. But what I would recommend is really thinking about it and specifically what you're looking for are Targa files. So if you're going to export out a still to an ATEM, you always want to use Targa. And that has to do with the way that the ATEM structures it. Remember I told you that the ATEM doesn't do that last punch. So it punches out the background and then it just adds the, the, the foreground. It doesn't punch, it doesn't reverse and punch the, the, the black or, or whatever around the thing that you're compositing over. That saves it a cycle, but it means that, that it, um, if you, uh, you have to kind of know what you're doing there. The target will be processed better, in my opinion. Um, there are ways to get the, P, the ping to do it, but you should not do that. Like <laughs> export it out. The reason that uh, the reason that Targa f exists in Affinity Photo is for the ATEM. <laughs> so, so just so you know, like the reason that, that it exports correctly uh, is is specifically because of the ATEM. Um, so, so you you do want to think about that. Is, is Targa files are what you want to use, and you can use stills. And in the larger ATEMs, you can use in, uh, sequences that'll have all those alpha channels in them. But you should be Targa sequences. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. You're going to get into uh, the possibility of alpha, uh, not alpha, um, aliasing and partially gray um, alpha channels so you can get transparency. Yeah, well, I, I think we'll we'll try to get we'll try to get to that um, as we as we move forward there. Yeah, go ahead. Next question. Robert Green, Los Angeles, asking: Are phones and other apps tools now cut out backgrounds? How does this come into play? They're creating alpha channels. You know, so when they're cutting out backgrounds, what I showed you with the with the little troll is is what they can't do very well. So, uh, you know, the like for instance, um, Photoshop in its elegant wisdom has a has a thing that just says cut out subject, and I I've used it when I'm in, when I did some of these I tried to use that subject. It actually does a pretty good job. I mean, I was kind of amazed at what it did but my alpha channels are better, you know, by, by sitting there and going. And so when we understand how to rebuild that alpha channel, we um, can produce something better. And so in general, uh, the level of the quality of that hair that you saw across the top or whether we keep the shadow down below, your phone's not going to do that. You know, like, so it's not going to, you know, and so you need, you want to understand how to generate those or how it's working. Um, but they are just generating those with alpha channels. And if they export a ping, now sometimes you'll get a ping. And what you need to know is that you you may need to, um, take that ping and rebuild the alpha channel for your switcher if you want to pop something in. So that means that um, if you take the the ping, you have to select it and then create an alpha channel. So to, to go back to what we were, um, you know, showing earlier, let me see if I have uh, my uh, little dude here. Can um, you use a ping 24 uh, transparency? Ping 24. Oh, um, it's yeah. You need twenty. You need transparency with the ping to to pull that out. But a lot of times, what will happen is your your phone or your software will produce a ping with a transparency, um, and you may be able to drop that in. But a lot of times, you may need to have the alpha channel exist as a separate channel. And in in that case, you you have to you know you just have to select it and turn it into an alpha channel in something like Photoshop. Uh, next question. Uh, Morgan Price from Victoria, British Columbia. Um, speaking of alpha channels, has anyone had trouble using OBS's deck link output with alpha channel? It appears broken since version 28 and no better in version 29, unless I've missed something. I don't think, I don't know, if, I don't think that we have anyone on the panel that's using OBS currently. So I'm not sure if we're, and I guess the question would also be, is that on a PC or on a Mac? Um, and so um, I don't, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not certain um, which which one you're talking about there, and if it's assuming the deck link you're talking about SDI, um, it should be able to time it on the way out. The, the big problem you end up with is in these key fills that Bo was talking about. Is if you're using HDMI, HDMI doesn't have a way to be timed perfectly to to the frame, and so you'll end up if you're using HDMI as an output. Oftentimes, those frames will be not lined up perfectly, and they have to be lined up obviously frame to frame, or it doesn't work. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so I think that that, that's the question too. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, how do you generate an alpha channel in an existing image? I, I think that I just covered that, um, as far as, you know, taking that image and, and generating that alpha channel. And, and a lot of it is again, finding, 
uh, you know, you'll see that I was using a bunch of different techniques to find the edges. You're, you're just looking at how do I build, you know, you want to really get down to, I'm just building a black and white image that represents the transparency of, of what, I'm, what I'm trying to do there. Um, let's go to the next question. Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio, Texas. If you had a video of Alex's troll, are there any shortcuts to do the alpha channel or do you have to rotoscope every frame? <laughs> uh, rotoscoping is used in 80% of every visual effect shot um, that you see in a movie. So that's one thing to know. It's just that in even they even use rotoscoping in animated films, which may sound insane. Um, I was talking to someone that worked out, was working on an animated film and they said it's easier to fix the rendering errors. You know, if you're rendering 45 minutes a frame, it's easier to have someone just paint out a, a rendering error than it is to actually go back and re-render it. So, um, so a lot of times rotoscoping is still used in a lot of those things. Now, one of the things that we do do, and I'll, we'll do this in a separate, um, in a separate second hour is that we will, um, uh, do what's called uh, animated garbage mats. And so we can either animate them by hand or we can do what's called procedural garbage mats. And so those procedural garbage mats, if I, if I um, let me see if I can, uh, uh, let's see. Um, I'm not gonna be able to generate that really quickly, but I'll show it to you when we talk about green screen. But procedural garbage mats, basically um, what you do is you cut a hard mat. You just push the contrast really, really hard. And you get this rough outline of the person that's there, the person that's walking across the green screen. Then you say, I wanted to expand that calculation. So turn, make the white, you know, basically get bigger. Um, and so you max, you do a max. What is the max value in this convolution kernel? And you just open it up. Now you have this thing that wraps around the person and you just ignore all the stuff around it. And then you do the same thing. You contract it inside the person. And then you say, black that out. So now the only thing that you see are the edges of that person. You have a core mat and you have a garbage mat. And now you have that person. And now that's going to help you just deal with those edges. And we'll talk about that. On a, I have some great examples of that for green screen. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. So I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if After Effects does this, but I know that there's a couple programs out there that I, I, I was playing with one about a month ago where you would take one frame and you'd create the alpha channel for that one frame. You bring those both in with the video and then it does its best to uh, create an alpha channel on the whole video. Um, I, try, I was trying to find the name of that program, but I can't find it right now. But I know there's a couple programs out there that are in their beta phases that are doing that. They're trying, you know, like so far we haven't seen a ton of them that have worked exceptionally well. I think that's always the challenge that we're, that we're having right now. Um, yeah, let's go to the next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. Bo, how did you generate that beautiful 3D title animation? Go ahead, Bo. Hey, Douglas. Yeah, we should uh, we should see about getting the expression team on uh, for a second hour at some point. But it's essentially it's part of uh, it's one of the templates available for expression. Um, it's really easy to type in whatever you want, and uh, and it just does the thing. So uh, you have you know your base scenes, and and you can just type change the text at will. Uh, next question. Next question from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. Are pings easier to key with NVIDIA as they contain alpha channels? I go ahead, Mitchell. They don't necessarily contain alpha channels unless there is, a, I said earlier, a ping 24-bit uh, with uh, transparency turned on um, has the ability to carry an alpha channel. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that uh, it, it depends on the, it depends on the, the, um, the application. <laughs> so what, what app is, uh, is being, is doing the ping. So some apps want to have pings. That's the only thing they want. They want them in a very specific way or some pieces of hardware because that's what they were built against. Um, in general, um, most of the stuff that we do, as far as if we're loading something in, we find that the target files are still better on in many platforms than the ping files, if they're supporting both of those. Um, go ahead, Courtney. I've always been confused by that. Do you have to use 32-bit if you're going to include the alpha channel so it uses the last eight bits for the alpha channel and the first uh I do believe you do. Yeah, it's a 32-bit. Uh, RGB, yeah. I mean, in Photoshop or a lot of other things, it just says, do you want to include the transparency? <laughs> you know, like, so that's, but I believe that's a 32-bit uh, ping. That is, it's the, it's the 24 for the color. The 24 bits is the eight bits per channel uh, for RGB. And then the last eight bits is for the uh, alpha channel. And, that is something to remember when you're doing these alpha channels is that you have eight bits to work with. So you have 256 levels of gray and that's it. So, so, you know, and that's why 
you often want to divide and conquer when we get back into like why you don't just increase contrast or increase level, you know, use the levels or curves is because you're, when you do that, you're just throwing a bunch of stuff away. And so you want to be very careful of not throwing things away as you, as you start to work on those, on those alpha channels. Uh, let's go to the next question. Marcelo Mayano in New Jersey. Besides Photoshop, there's an app for Mac that works great for selection and cleaning up backgrounds faster to get alpha channels. It's called is Pixelmator. There, oh, Pixelmator. Yeah. So what I just showed you, you can't do in that I know of, uh, you can't do in Pixelmator or in Affinity Photo. It's why we use Photoshop. Or that's why I have literally that what I just showed you is why I still own a copy of Photoshop. Um, so you can do a lot of selections, but doing fine alpha channel management inside of the app is not something that, and I've had discussions with the folks at Pixel. I mean, unless maybe that's changed in the last couple of years because I haven't used it, but exposing those, uh, it's much more difficult to expose a ch alpha channel in Pixelmator or Affinity Photo than it is in, in, uh, in Photoshop. They're, they just don't have the alpha channels there. And so that's been the, um, it's why I literally the, non-management of alpha channels as a distinct thing is why I uh, still you have Photoshop. Like that is the, that is the reason. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, so hopefully they'll somehow fix that. Anyway, Mitchell. Another app that does a great job is a planar tracking system that can create an alpha channel. Uh, it's called uh, Mocha Pro. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it, again, it's doing, it's yeah. Generating mats, you know, from, you know, Mocha, you know, and, and it can do a lot, a lot of that technology does a lot of different things to make that work. Um, but Mocha is very popular in the area of rotoscoping too, because they'll let it do some of the work for them. And then they only have to fine tune it. And we should, it'd be fun to have those guys on talk about it a little bit. It's good. Uh, next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. Bo, what switcher engine are you using for your demonstrations, and how did you get the multi-view into Zoom? Go ahead, Bo. Yeah, I'm using a, uh, it's a Ross Carbonite Ultra, um, which is what I happen to have in my kit downstairs. So it's basically a 24 input, 14 output switcher, uh, provides four multi-views, and I just have one of those multi-views routed back into itself, then I have an aux feed feeding my Zoom via uh, UTAP. So pretty simple setup. Next question. Bo Sturdivant from San Antonio, Texas. How do you handle alpha channels through glass? Go ahead, Mitchell. Ultimat does a great job with it. Well, and yeah, and the question is, are you keying through glass or, or handling alpha channels? So you want to make sure that, you know, keying is the process of generating an alpha channel from whatever image that you have going through it. Um, so if you're, if you're cutting through glass, the main thing that you, what you're capturing from glass is the imperfections and the highlights and so on and so forth that are there. So if it's perfectly clear, we'll just key right through it. Um, and the main thing is, is that you, but you're trying to save those white edges or those lighter areas, those highlights over top of it um, to, to make sure that that alpha channel actually works. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, asking, in DaVinci Resolve, what available video export formats, formats support an alpha channel? Are there any advantages in one over another? Um, yeah, so the, typically if we're sending something out and then we still have to convert it somewhere, uh, typically out of Resolve, we are um, exporting out as a TIFF sequence. Um, the challenge for Resolve is that unless it's changed in 18, and I, I haven't, I actually haven't tested it for a little while, but um, unless it's changed, it's, Resolve itself doesn't export a TGA sequence, which is the thing that looks the best in Blackmagic's own hardware. Um, and so um, I, they may have, I, there have been just some, folks have brought it up. <laughs> so uh, I think it will do a ping sequence um, or, a, or a TIFF sequence. Um, the hard part is, is that it's, it's, you know, again, it's been difficult to get what we need out of these things uh, processed. And it was a little bit, I guess, I guess that's a technical would be ironic that, that, uh, that um, resolve, resolve doesn't generate the, the files that we actually need for the same company's hardware. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, again, an alternative uh, after effects, uh, it's usually referred to as millions of colors plus is uh, in important. And if you're using ProRes 444, um, it's going to put the alpha channel out just as a matter of fact. And uh, yes, 
so so the uh, uh, After Effects is the one the one animation app that does that does the the target sequences correctly. Um, now remember that if you're doing the other way to to do this out of Resolve is to do exactly what Mitchell was talking about is Apple ProRes four four four. You put it into a hyperdeck into one of the hyperdecks with two channels and it'll do key fill out and then you have all your all your stuff that's generated from there. Or you have another app, you know, like, uh, you know, there's a variety of other apps that will do key fill. So if you're looking for that key fill output. Um, so you can generate video files out of Resolve and out of pretty much anything that has an alpha channel. Uh, what you can't do is the sequences, um, uh, or at least the last time I checked. Uh, next question. Dave Trotman in Edmonton, Canada. Does motion create good keys and mats? Uh, so um, motion will do a strong key and mat in Apple ProRes 44444, 444, 444, 4x4. Four, 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 four. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so Motion will do that just fine because it's an Apple product and ProRes is an Apple product and so they all get along. Um, the, uh, where it, Motion also doesn't do a very good job is target sequences. So uh, you can actually export via compressor a target sequence but it's a compressed target sequence, and so it doesn't actually work. <laughs> so, so you know, so the uh, um, so it's it's a uh, uh, getting target sequences out of motion is is another challenge. And so, um, so anyway, so those are the those are the the things that you have to kind of um, uh, process there. If you have Photoshop, I believe that I've kind of gone through Photoshop. I have Photoshop. I've been kind of unwilling to pay the subscription for the rest of the Adobe suite. And so, um, uh, so I think that you can actually run you can export a sequence and then run it through Photoshop and convert it to target files, um, you know, using just Photoshop's video or, or sequence um, processing. So that's another way that we, that we make it that actually work. Um, but again, if you have a, if you have a key fill output, like what Bo showed, like, so expression, um, there's tons and tons, almost anything that does graphics output, um, will, will do that correctly. So, um, so it's a pretty straightforward thing to, uh, to make happen. There we go. A little shorter than normal, but but we uh, covered it. I think we talked a lot more about alpha channels and hopefully illustrated a little bit more and got people thinking about it. We'll talk more about how to generate those alpha channels. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I felt like I didn't, I didn't prep for doing something in, in the ATEM itself because I felt like there was going to be enough to talk about here. Obviously, I could have. Um, so we'll, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the future, we'll, we'll in the not too distant future, we'll talk about Keen and the ATEM um, as well as the other one that we'll talk about is Green Screen Keen. Um, so, and there's probably, there's going to be two different hours. Um, I want to do one where we just show you files of green screen and we do it. And then the second one, we'll, we'll try to actually be on a, you know, pick up a green screen and, and show it to you. Um, you know, on a stage and, and, and just kind of have you see what we do with lighting. And because the first thing you want to understand is how to green screen and what the challenges are and how to, and what we're dealing with. And then the second thing you want to deal with is, is what to, that'll, that informs how you actually, you know, build those green screens later. So. Love to I, see a, uh, uh, a review of the Ultimate devices from uh, Yeah, we Black can get Magic. one of those. They're good. They're not only good, they're amazing. <laughs> so uh, the Ultimate, Ultimate devices are, are really, um, I owned a, not that I'm bitter, but I owned a, an Ultimat 11 with 444, um, and that was like thirty-three thousand um, dollars. And now there, now you can buy something that would do what it did. Uh, well, 422. So the 422 version of that was like twenty-five thousand. It's now, I think, uh, is it hundreds of dollars for the little the little one? Like four hundred um, bucks. Four hundred bucks, yeah. So not that you know. Anyway, it it, it does 422, and it has most of the tools that that were in the Ultimat. The um, so we'll, we'll probably review that one and we can talk about, it'd be fun to compare that one to the ultra HD one, which I think is $2,500, which is still inc an incredible value. Um, and then they have an 8k one. I, it was funny. I, I, I wanted to use the 8k one as a, um, multi-camera keyer, but I don't know if it'll actually do that. So, um, so we're, 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 we're trying to figure out, we, we think that you could do it cause it does quad in quad out. You could just build four quad weird thing where you had four keys that were coming in and you know four things and then four outs and but it's not it's you would be asking to do something that um yeah it's a little different so anyway we'll we'll, we'll talk about that in the future uh, next next question tommy shantz in st paul minnesota asking can you do this in affinity instead of photoshop you can do a lot of the compositing in affinity the the, the alpha channel operation that i just did would is dip more difficult in affinity and I, it was just it's more convoluted um, than, than what I showed there. Um, I don't think that the channel, I don't believe that the affinity has the channel math the way that I showed it there. Um, and it also doesn't have like 
distinct alpha channels. So what you end up doing is having to grab them and do it like I only do this channel. It, I tried to build the I tried to build the demo in Affinity last night and just couldn't find a way to do it in a way that just didn't seem like I just it, it just felt like I was just doing all these extra steps that that I uh, and it's why again the the ability to explicitly handle alpha channels is why I still have a copy of Photoshop. You know, is is you know when I when I need to do those things, it's the only reason it's still there. Uh, I can do everything else in Affinity. So so um so I think that that's the um so I and I do um but but this is the one the one place where I open up Photoshop to, to talk about those things. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, another uh, uh, area plugins are a great place to go. Like Primat from uh, from Maxon, formerly Red Giant, uh, Boris FX, all those guys, and the old uh, venerable key light. You know, I'd, it's funny. Um, I know we have a little time, so I, can, I don't use very many plugins. <laughs> like it's it's a, as I I used to like literally have every Photoshop plugin that existed, and I had most of the most of the plugins for other things, and I use so few now. Like, and and I think a lot of it has to do with that I tend to roll my own solutions for things. Like, I just go, oh, I'm gonna like if I'm gonna do a composite, I oftentimes you know again I've been I haven't had a good business reason to own Nuke, um, but once you start using uh, nodal compositors or any kind of nodal system, it's very hard to go back to layers. Like layers are kind of this painful, weird little thing that you have to deal with. Um, and, uh, and so you're used to nodal. And so I'm finding myself spending more and more time inside of, uh, um, to do when I do composites and complex composites, I'm finding more and more time inside of fusion, inside of resolve. And, um, but I just tend to build everything myself because I used to. You know, and I think that that, you know, and then you have a lot more control and you have the the dials that you want to create for it and stuff like that. Um, so that's the, and even when we used to have uh, a thing called, you know, this program called Conduit, we literally built Conduit as a plugin for motion. So we would have Conduit sitting inside of motion um, and you would just draw the thing, drop, drop the things into it and you could do a full composite, nodal composite inside of motion while we were working and we, it was it greatly accelerated things because you had a GPU powered real time system. So you could we were we had to key like a hundred and ten car plates. You know, people sitting inside of a car with green screen behind them, and we did it all in like a week. You know, in in motion uh, for a film um, because it was it was just a lot easier to go through that. Um, next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. Can Mimo Live or other software like it generate key and fill from an image automatically? I uh, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, from an image automatically, that's that's tougher. I, I I'm not sure about Memo Live, but Wirecast has uh, really upped the game last year on uh, different types of uh, key fills, and you can do different different mats from. Uh, but yeah, I think you still need a green screen to do it. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, without a green screen, I think they use a difference mat, which looks at basically in video looks at every pixel coming in, and if it's moved. If it's moved in the last since the last frame, it's considered foreground. If it hasn't moved, it's considered background, and that's what it uses for determining, f separating foreground from background. Uh, and it's uh, iffy at best. That's how you get the people with the the crawling uh, mat lines that are around them. You know. Yeah. Now it it can do key fill if you give it alpha channels. <laughs> you know, like if you give it an alpha channel, it doesn't carry, it doesn't create it automatically. It does create it automatically if that image sequence has an alpha channel. <laughs> so if that video has an alpha channel, then it automatically will do key fill because key fill is not alpha channels. Key fill is using an alpha channel, but the key in it is the alpha channel and the fill is the color. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA, asking what ingest supports the live alpha channel creation of Ultimat and what considerations for sending an Ultimat to a remote contributor? Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. ProRes can do it. Um, in the old days, we used to use uh, animation codec or two files. One was the Hi-Con and the other was the uh, the graphic. Yeah, so as far as hardware that can ingest that, any, the, any switcher that does key fill will, 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 will take the Ultimat. It, I will say that it gets complicated with an Ultimat when you start to, you're now depending on the keyer um, to the, the keyer inside of your hardware to do that. So if you're with an Ultimat, a lot of times we want to send the composite because there's a bunch of other things that all the edge stuff that Courtney and I were talking about talking about earlier. That's the part that gets hard. If you start hand, handing that out to an external switcher, you have the alpha channel and then you have the you have the background, but or the in the foreground. 
but what you don't have is how am I going to take the background and, and mess with the pixels on the foreground, um, you know, there. And that's the part we don't we don't necessarily have um, in, in, in that's what Ultimate will do inside, you know, so it's doing things to the edge while it's doing the composite that's based on the background. So if you do a key and you send out just the alpha and the, the you know, the foreground and the alpha and the and the background, you may not get the result that you're looking for, you know, on the way out. Now, go ahead, Bo. Yeah, just to expand upon that a little bit, when we do like AR graphics, we'll do internal compositing inside the 3D engine so that you do get some of those reflections from the background and, and you know, those edges you were talking about uh, where you would not get that if you were just sending out a key fill and then compositing down downstream. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. And you know, like you were saying, the best uh, is to let the box do it uh, because you get those aliasing or dancing pixels around edges, things like that. When you try to uh, combine them separately, you need the boxes hey, smart. You, you, you may have the, you may have the uh, that, usually something wrong if you're seeing the aliasing, but if they're, but you will, you may see just uh, a uh, corruption of the images of it being a little too bright or a little too dark because it's there. The other thing you want to think about, and we'll talk about this when we're talking about Keen, is um, to always remember that your video camera is generating, uh, is sharpening. So um, uh, sharpening is a process of making the darker, if, if there's a dark line and a, there's a dark object in front of a lighter background. How sharpening works is it makes the lighter just a little lighter and the darker just a little darker. And the more you turn the sharpening up, the more it does that. And if you turn the sharpening all the way up, you'll see a black line along your, you know, and a white line around it. That sharpening makes keen, makes pulling that much harder because all those little things are now, you know, it's not purely green and it's not purely the, the foreground object. It's some kind of weird, like brighter version and darker version. So you'll notice a lot of times with people's keys, they have a dark edge around them or a dark edge around where there's, um, where they have a darker um, something, you know, so something that's like this shirt keys really well because it's in a mid-tone. Um, and, it, but if you have a dark, darker thing, sometimes those get dark, get pushed. So what you have to do is you have to turn the, you have to turn the sharpening down to make that actually work. The problem is then you have to put the sharpening back in after you did the sharp, and, and you can see an example of that if you watch the last playoffs that were there with, um, uh, I don't remember who was doing the playoffs uh, on the last one, but the, the last playoffs that were out there, they were keyed in front of it and they were softer than the background. And the two problems that they had there is they must have turned the sharpening off on the camera so they get a good key. Key wasn't very good anyway. <laughs> and you have to you have to deal with the key. light light wrap around yeah. and the back matching mm -hmm. the background to the foreground. Right. It's all kinds of stuff. But what you what you could see there if you go back to that if you have YouTube live or some other way or you T voted or whatever is you'll notice that the foreground folks are softer than the background. Um, and the reason that happens is people turn the sharpening down so that they can do the key. Um, and then they don't turn it, then you have to resharpen the whole image to get it, to get them, to bring them back up, which can be done, but it's, it's a little bit of extra work. It's easier if you just do a better, uh, lighting on the key, on the background. <laughs> Next question. Albi Lopez in San Antonio, Texas asking, can you cover some of the file formats for alpha channel? SPX only supports WebM when importing alpha channels. Yeah, so um, yeah, SPX may be doing that because it's, it's largely a you know it's a web based um, you know system, so it needs to have those there. Uh, the ones that are typical for this is a TIFF sequence, uh, ping sequence, TGA sequence. Uh, animation is the uh, file format that carries an alpha channel with it, as well as the alpha uh, or sorry Apple ProRes four 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 carries alpha channel with it. Um, those are uh, I'm not sure if there's any others. Um, that there's no other major ones that carry alpha channels. So you have um, Targa, Ping, TIFF, Photoshop sequence, if you really wanted to do that. Um, and uh, so those are the major ones that of the stills that will have that. And then video is is mostly animation or um, ProRes. Um, I don't even know how to export WebM. I'm sure we figured it out because we have this stuff, but I don't, I, I don't, uh, I haven't, I haven't had to do that. So um, yeah, so the, those are the ones, those are the major ones that will do alpha channels. All right, so we uh, we are done for the day. Reminder that uh, Tony Mobley is uh, no, tomorrow. Oh, ruthless, uh, tomorrow is oh, tomorrow. We're doing um, ruthless reviews. Um, so we uh, uh, so that that's going to be tomorrow. Is also um, we have a big lab day. We have got Squares TV at at uh, ten a.m. Uh, Canvas and Keynote at one thirty p.m. Tony Mobley behind the scenes at four p.m. So there's a lot of things. The the the, the after hours is starting to pick up speed. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. 
And I want to invite uh, folks that want to learn a little more about reading and being a panelist. Uh, we have our workshop today at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 Eastern. And um, and just, we did 48,000 miles in the Tlaloc Traversal, 78,000 kilometers, 442 million bananas. Thanks to the uh, thanks to the producers for all the great questions. Keep us going. Keep 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 the conversation moving. And uh, thanks to the panelists. We can't do this without you. And it's always great to have everybody coming in. Thanks to Bo, especially coming in with a little bit of extra graphics. We don't see Bo very often there, and he just he just popped in out of nowhere. So uh, it's, it's great to have you there. And um, and then of course thanks to the incredible team on the back end that's making this happen seven days a week. Uh, you'll see the you'll see the long list of people that work on this. Not just the 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 show itself but the development of it the design of it all those things it's just an incredible team so um so thanks to everyone doing that all right let's go ahead and jump into after hours by the way mid journey does incredible trolls so many good trolls i mean hundreds of trolls that's just one of so many trolls it's that troll based on your image alex it was not see everybody <laughs> thinks it was everybody thinks it was it was not my wife looked at it she goes did you put your did you put your thing and i was like i did not put my thing in there that is not me that troll is not me wait a second are you I trolling felt, us i felt a little i felt a little defensive about the whole thing i did put a troll in to say make a troll out of me and it didn't look nearly as good as the troll <laughs> so, so i was like how the heck with it